Father, we thank you for a beautiful day that you have granted us. Every day is good, regardless of the weather, regardless of the circumstances. But these are days that you have ordained, uh, Lord, to build us and to draw us near to you. So, Father, we gather to open up this wonderful letter that John has written, uh, Father, for what he's heard from Christ. And we pray that we can learn from it and, and walk in the light that has been laid before us. We know that Jesus is delight. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. I want you to turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1. And of course, we know we're not confusing the gospel of John. We're talking about the letter of John that is towards the book of Revelation. So if you're at the gospel where you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's not that's the same author, but that's that's his gospel. We're going to look towards the end of the Bible, where you'll see first, second, third, John, Jude, and Revelation. So I'm at first John chapter one. Last week we began our series on the first epistle of John, and we learned that an epistle is a letter. And this specific letter is written specifically to Christians. So if you are a born-again Christian, well, this letter's for you. This letter's for me. And um, we learned last week that the Apostle John wanted to establish uh, the authority that he has for writing this letter. So he used an, apost um, an apostleship criteria. If you remember from verse 1? where he says that we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we have observed and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, that is Jesus Christ. And that's the criteria for an apostleship. He's saying that I have the authority to write this letter so that you can receive it. Now he states this because not only because he is an eyewitness, he was in the presence of Jesus, but unfortunately there was a lot of false teaching. There's a lot of false teachers, and he's saying, I don't want you to listen to them. I'm giving you the proper letter that comes from Christ. So then in verse 3, he shifts by, or verse 2, I should say, he talks about the importance of him testifying to the truth, declaring to us eternal life that is with the Father that has been revealed to us, of course, through Jesus Christ. So he wants to testify about the truth of Jesus against these false teachings. And then we learn in verse 3 that because we are Christians, we can have koinonia. Does anybody remember what koinonia means? All right, one hand at a time, one hand at a time. All right, koinonia, if you remember, is the word fellowship. But it's not just a general fellowship, like hanging out with the fellas, you know, or something like that. We're talking about... Uh, Yes, right here. I don't want to touch it because I think I'm a little under the weather here. So koinonia is an intimate type of connection that we're called to have with God and also with one another. We're called to have fellowship with one another. Uh, we're called to love one another, forgive one another, bless one another, and, and enjoy one another. But also we're called to have fellowship also with God as well. As Christians, we have access to God and also fellowship with others. And then in verse 4, John, we concluded last week that the purpose of life is to experience joy, a fullness type of joy, a complete joy that comes with Christ. So today, what I want us to do is to almost as if we are going to the doctors. When you go to the doctors, you're getting an examination. You know, you may go once, twice a year. Some of us go four times a year, whatever the issue is, whatever your insurance permits. We get blood work and we get examinations. So today, that's what I want to do. I want to examine our hearts. I want to examine our walk. Are we walking in light? Or are we walking in darkness? So I've entitled this morning's uh, this morning, this evening's message, walking. Uh, in the light. So that is the goal. So if you're taking notes, I got two points. Point number one, 
I want to talk about how God is light. God is light. Let me read verse, uh, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. God is light, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. All right, so I want you to, before we talk about this characteristic of God, this attribute, I want you to notice the strong emphasis that the Apostle John places, not just in this verse, but throughout the epistle, you're going to see it repeated, that this message is not from him. This message is from Jesus. It's from God. And he wants to be faithful with what he writes down. He wants to be faithful to Jesus with the things he's seen and the things he's heard from the time he was with in Jesus's ministry. So whatever Jesus said, whatever Jesus taught, whatever Jesus believes, he's going to present it to us. And it's important for Jesus to, I'm sorry, for the Apostle John to do it, do this in such a way that he does not add on or take away. He wants to keep the, muse, the, the message of Jesus as pure as possible. All right? And that is the same way it is today with pastors, Sunday school teachers, evangelists. We're called to preach God's word in his purity. That is to say, to not add on what does, you know, to say things that doesn't say or to remove things or not preach on it because we don't like it. What's wrong with doing that? What's wrong? Um, we know that there's many, unfortunately, and I don't like saying this, but it's true, where there are many churches and pastors that hand select their teachings that won't teach on certain things for whatever reason. Why do you think some of those reasons are? All right. Um, Darlene is next. To, Darlene, raise your hand high. So there we go. Okay. I, is the mic on? Because they don't want to offend people. Oh, that's a big one. That's a big one. And, you know, to be honest with you, I don't like offending people either. I don't like to offend people. But we have to proclaim the truth for what it is. Imagine the doctor getting blood work and say, this doesn't look good. Hey, everything is fine. Everything's good. You're going to be all fine. Don't worry about it. Just keep going. Do we want to live in deceit or do we want the truth? And bottom line, what we need to do is proclaim the truth the way it is. Um, if I proclaim something that is offensive to someone, they may despise me, but ultimately they're despising Jesus or they're despising the prophets. They're just, they're, it's coming from God. They have something that they're rejecting uh, that is pertaining to them. There's things here in Scripture that's very, very powerful, very strong, very encouraging, very uplifting. But there's also a lot of things that are quite hard and even offensive. But we do not have the authority to water it down. And that's what John is stating here at the beginning of verse 5. He says here, this is the message we have heard from him and declared to you. So this is the message from, from Jesus, and he's declaring it to us. Um, so if this message is from Jesus, then now the next question is this. He says here, God is light, here in verse 5, and there is absolutely no darkness in him. Now we come into a little bit of a sticky area. You guys ready for this? If this message comes from God, and he's proclaiming what comes from God, where did John get the idea that God is light? Where in the Bible does it say that God is light? Um, um, apparently, this is the only text. What was that? Well, he created the light. 
right? Light, but God is not created. God created light, but God himself is not a created light. Psalm, Psalm 139 said he, he can't hide from, from, from God because God is light. It's Psalms 139? 139. Okay. Okay, I got to look that up. So Okay. All right. Marvy. Correct. Yeah. So so Mar Mar yeah, that's in Revelations 21. Marvy is stating um when we get towards the end of time in the new heavens and the new earth, we're not going to need light. Uh but the question here is that John says that God is light. So scholars are like, they're baffled. They're saying, where did he get this concept from? He didn't get it from Jesus because nowhere in the Gospels does Jesus say that God is light. Uh, Rosie? But didn't Jesus say he is the light? And he said, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I'm going to tell you something right now, Rosie. You keep stealing from my notes, and I don't appreciate that. Because that's exactly right. Marvy, can I get, um, and by the way, it's by the same author. In John, in his gospel, uh, John chapter 8, verse 12, Rosie is absolutely right. So anyway, uh, while Marvy is getting the passage there, in, in John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am light of the world. And then later on in John 14, verse 9, Jesus says, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Sir, Rosie, you're absolutely right. Go ahead, um, George. Hold on. I, I, I don't know if the mic is off or on. Right. But we're talking about if God is light. We're, we're, we're trying to find a teaching that says that God is light. Right, right. Okay. All right. So, but here we see that this this is very interesting because although Jesus not does not explicitly say God is light, what he does say is that he is light. So Jesus says, I am light of the world. So then John decides to say, Okay, since Jesus says he's light, then God is light, and that means what? That Jesus is what? He is light and he's God. So there's a beautiful explicit passage here that he's connecting Jesus to God, that Jesus is God. Here we see that, um, yeah, so here's the full passage. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to them again. I am light of the world. Anyone who follows me will never walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. And then in John 14, uh, verse 9, we have that. If not, it's not a big deal. All right, so let me go ahead and, and, and move on here. So in John's epistle, he begins, he begins here with the attribute of God, affirming that God is light, right? In verse 5, verse 5, he says, God is light. I want you to observe that he doesn't say that God is light mostly light, or that God is quite bright, but God is light. He is pure light, is the idea. Matter of fact, what is, in verse 5, what does he contrast God is light with? What is the contrast there in verse 5? Um, hold on for one second, yeah. Darkness. Absolutely. Notice, he not only says that God is light, but then he says, there in verse 5, there's absolutely no darkness in him. Some of your translations may say no, uh, uh, no darkness at all, or something along those lines. So we see the contrast. Not only is Jesus light, but there's no shadows in him. There's no darkness. Jesus is pure light. Now, here's the next, uh, I got two questions for you. Obviously, there's a lot of metaphors that are, that's going on here. What do you think the word light 
means. How, how do you think um, John is using the word light? What do you think light means? Uh, hold, Stephen, hold on for one second, brother. By the way, the reason I need the uh, the microphone is so those on Zoom can hear it. I would say holiness. The holiness of God, absolutely. Anybody else? Truth. Truth? Okay, yes. Definitely truth. So we have the idea of holiness. Um, how about purity? There's like no blemishes in him. He's absolutely perfect. Anybody else? Rosie? I guess I was going to say no sin, but all of that Ooh, covers. Yes. Absolutely. No sin, no evil. Yes. All right, so now, if that is what light is, what's darkness? The opposite of everything you put up there on the light. Okay, so what are some of the opposites? Sin? Evil? Maybe corruption? Death? Anybody else? Say it again. Deception? Absolutely. Matter of fact, who's the prince of darkness? The devil, right? So um, God is absolutely light and there's no darkness in him. Matter of fact, he's making it clear this is an attribute of God. He is holy. So it's not that God brings light, although he does bring light. It's not that he gives light, although he does that. He is absolutely light. He is pure and he is holy. To gain a better grasp, to enter into the mind of the Apostle John, when he begins this letter, you know how he begins it? He begins it with knowing who God is. He begins with God. I want you to observe how he begins with God and not with man. Here in verse 5, he says, This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, and there's absolutely no darkness in him. So although he does not begin with our needs, our needs are important, but he doesn't begin there. He begins with God. Do you think there's a good reason for that? Why does John begin with God and not with man? Anybody? Okay. Well, it's always good and wise to start with God. God is the standard of life. If we want to know how or who he is, if we want to know how to please him, we go to him. God is our creator, our sustainer, and he is light. And as light, God opposes sin. So the Apostle John begins with God because he wants to develop within us a biblical worldview, a way of viewing life. We view life not through the lenses of man. We view life through the lenses of God on how to please him. Now, this attribute, oh, I'm sorry, Diana. Bob and I had always, we had talked about this a while ago, and this is a good time to bring this up. But when you're talking about light and darkness, somebody told me that God didn't create darkness. But in Isaiah 45, it says, I am the Lord and there is no other. I create the light and make the darkness. Yeah. I send good times and bad times. I, the Lord, am the one who does these things. So the question there is, what does darkness mean in that context? Does it mean sin, evil? It can't mean that. It has to mean something within creation in Genesis 1, mm -hmm. right? When he created the heavens and the earth, and therefore there was darkness and he called light. 
So it's good to see it within the Genesis context, but he doesn't create sin no. or anything or evil or anything wicked no. like that. But yeah, that's a, that's a very good passage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. God is the creator of light and also of darkness of the earth, of heaven and earth. I was, somebody once said that, oh, God didn't create darkness, but it says it right there. He did. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess it depends on what they mean by darkness. Mm -hmm. And that's why we have to define um, what they mean, because mm -hmm. Isaiah is using darkness in a different way than Moses used darkness in Genesis. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, light, uh, I don't, when, when it says God is light, I'm not, I don't think he's talking about light bulbs or anything mm -hmm. like that, you know, mm -hmm. although those are lights, mm -hmm. you know, there's different ways. Jesus claims to be the door. I don't think it means that he's a, a wooden, uh, whatever, uh, eight by five, whatever. But yeah, so the context rules. So we have to understand what the context says. Thank you. Um, do you think, um, is the attribute of God being light a beautiful thing or a bad thing? Is it a good thing or a bad thing? God being light. It's a good thing. Amen. It would have to be, and that seems to be common sense, except I personally believe that this is probably the attribute that most people hate. People don't like light. They don't like holiness. They don't like any of these type of things. These are the things they reject, and there's a reason for that. Marvie, would you happen to have John 3.20? In John chapter 3, verse 20, it explains to us um, it explains what it is. So I guess in, here, I'll read, I'll read it here. So in John 3, 20, it reads, for everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that their deeds may not be exposed. There it is. Thank you, Marvy. So what we have here is um, the fact that people by nature, we are sinful creatures and we don't like the light. When the light turns on, we hide. We, we don't want to be exposed, uh, have our sins. You often hear people, and I want to be careful be, um, with what I say here because like I was talking like with Diana, that there's different context here. One of the common things I often hear, especially among the young people is, well, my God doesn't judge. My God doesn't judge people. He's not going to judge me and things like that. And what I hear them saying is they don't like the light of God. They don't like God is light. Now, I understand that perhaps they've been hurt, wounded. I don't know what the context is. So I want to be very um, gentle with how I say this. But to say that God doesn't judge is to say that God doesn't care about justice. That God doesn't care about the wicked things that happen. And that people get away with the wicked things. But God is good. And he is holy. And he is light. Light in the most purest sense. We like to be autonomous. How you like that word? Autonomous. Autonomous means to be free from law. I think from an early age, we want to be the free from the laws of our parents, right? We don't like to be told what to do from our parents when our parents say do this. We say no from the age of two years old or whatever. But as we get older, we challenge the authority of school teachers and principals. And then as we become adults, we challenge the rules of government. But ultimately, we challenge the laws of God. We don't like to be told what to do. I like to be a law to myself, onto myself. I decide what's right and wrong. You don't tell me what to do. And often, we, we may not verbally say this, but this is how we also think of God. God doesn't tell us what to do. And, and that is a horrible thing. God, my God doesn't judge. But ultimately, if, if we're going to follow Jesus, 
that we're called to walk in the light and not in darkness. Look at verse 6. John writes, if we say we have fellowship with him, that is with Jesus, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. Right? So we are called to walk in light, and that means to follow Jesus. If we're not being obedient to his teachings, then we're walking in darkness, and we are lost. So it begins, if we're going to walk in light, it's got to begin by embracing Jesus. It begins here by saying, I am a sinner. I am a sinner, and, and I deserve judgment, but I know God is merciful, and he's provided a way out through Jesus Christ. And therefore, I surrender my life to him. It begins there. That's salvation. If you think about the ABCs, A, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. B, I believe that Jesus is Lord. He can save me. C, I now commit myself in following him. A, B, C, I acknowledge, I believe, I commit. It begins there. That's what a Christian is. It's not enough to say, yes, I believe Jesus existed. Yes, I think he died on the cross. Yes, he rose from the grave. You know what? Even the devil believes that. The question here is, do I acknowledge that I'm a sinner? Why do I have to acknowledge that I'm a sinner? Is that even important? How would you explain that to someone? Well, I'm not a sinner. I'm fine. I do good things. I give to charity. I, I help this lady out uh, with her stuff at home, and I'm a good person. Why, why is it important to acknowledge that uh, we are sinners, Bruce? Yeah, we're born sinners, but yes, that's true. So why do I have to acknowledge it? Why can you know why 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 can't we just bypass that part? And just say, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Why do, why do I first have to acknowledge that I am a sinner? Or maybe I don't need to acknowledge that. Marty? Yeah, Jesus died on the cross. I heard somebody else. Oh, Carol, hold on for one second. There we go. Because if you weren't a sinner, you don't need Jesus. So you are a sinner, you need Jesus. Bingo. Absolutely. Here's the thing. Sins are crimes against God. We've broken God's laws and we've committed cosmic crimes against God. And therefore, we're going to come face to face with God. If you don't think you're sin, then you don't need a savior. Only sinners need savior. So I, I realized, uh, although I went to church at, at an Early age, I heard the whole thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, we're sinners, whatever. Nobody's perfect. Until one day, Jesus got a hold of me. And I realized, you know what? I'm living in sin. And I've always, I've always lived in sin, but I didn't realize that until now. I recognize I am a sinner. And if I was to die today, I would, I would go to hell. I will be judged, rightly so. So what I need is not justice. What I need is mercy. I need grace. I need forgiveness for the crimes I committed. Then Jesus comes, and he lived a holy life. He never sinned. I did, but he never sinned. He lived the holy life. And if I can, um, if I can draw this here, because... I, I love these visuals here. Hopefully, please let me know if this makes sense. So my life, this is my life here. This is me, sin. And here's Jesus, the cross. If I am judged in my sins, I will be punished, rightly so. That's not unfair. That's fair. That's just and righteousness. Evil wickedness is to be 
punished. But what if I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior? This is what happens. My sins are transferred unto Jesus. So for the sins that I commit, God doesn't ignore it. Because to ignore it is to say, ah, who cares? A lot of people ask, why can't, I, why can't God just merely ignore sin? Imagine this. What if I was to judge? Cliff, can I pick on you for a little bit? Cliff is a, is a great guy, but he came, and let's just say there's a woman here. He was drunk driving, and he killed her daughter. He comes to the judge, me, and I'm the judge, and he says, I am so sorry that I, I, I was drinking. I shouldn't have done it. I killed this young lady's daughter. Forgive me. And I say, you know what, Cliff? I forgive you. Is that a loving thing? Maybe. Is that a just thing? No. Because the crime was committed and no one pays for it. She still lost her daughter. Somebody's got to pay for that crime. So God doesn't just, when we say, Lord, forgive me, he doesn't say, okay, let me ignore your sins. Your sins still have to be dealt with. So when we trust in Jesus, our sins are transferred to Christ, and Christ is punished for the sins that I committed. But here, that's part of the good news. Here's the other good news. The beautiful, holy life that Jesus lives gets transferred to me. So when God the Father, when I die, he sees me, he sees Jesus and says, welcome home. The only way we get to heaven is if we are clothed with Jesus, if Jesus' goodness is placed on our account. Do you guys follow? Someone, are there any questions about this? This is the gospel in a nutshell. If you don't place your trust in Jesus, you're still in your sin. They say you can't get away from taxes and death. I've seen people get away from taxes, but nobody gets away from death. When you die, according to Hebrews 9, after death, judgment. And because God is light, he's holy and just, judgment is mandatory. And I know for me, if I'm still in my sins, I'll be judged rightly. I don't want to be judged rightly. I'm begging for mercy. And God will give me Jesus. And Jesus is punished for my sin. He gives me his righteousness. So therefore, I live for Jesus because he changed my life. So it begins there. But now... John says, not only does, do we embrace Jesus, we must follow his teachings. Here in verse 6, if we say we have fellowship with him, and yet we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. So we are to follow Jesus in his teachings, which is found in the Bible. Now the question here is, what is your authority for life? Is it the world? Or is it the word? Let me tell you something. You have an authority. There's something that you go by. And the Bible in Ephesians 2 talks about three things. Number one, the world is probably many of our authority. Whatever the world says, we do. Another one is the devil. The devil can be our authority, whether we realize this or not. But here's the biggest deceiver. The biggest authority that you may have that troubles you is you. You choosing to do what you want to do instead of what the Bible tells us to do. James tells us that we're not only to be hearers of the word, but to be doers as well. All right, is there any questions so far regarding what was discussed? All right, so we walk in light, not in darkness. Verse 7 says, if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus' Son cleanses us from all sins. So here we have that we are we are cleansed uh, from our sins, and we're going to talk more about that at the end here. All right. So point number one: God is light. Point number two: We need to walk in the light. 
walk in the light. Here, this whole letter here, this letter that we have from John is written to Christians and he wants us to examine our lives, to see it as a mirror as we look at ourselves. It's easy for me to examine everybody here, but it's hard to examine myself. So he wants us to examine ourselves regarding sin and also on how to deal with sin. So John wants us to develop a biblical worldview of sin so that we can learn to walk in the light and not in deception. Look at verse 8. That's what he says in essence. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. All right? So who in the world will say that they're not sinners? Well, there's several categories of people. Number one, atheist. An atheist is a person who doesn't believe in God. Or somebody who's just a non-believer. They will say, no, I don't believe in God. Or if he does exist, who cares? I don't believe in sin. Because they don't believe in God's word. They don't believe in God's moral law. They're a law to themselves. They decide what's right or wrong. So for them, they think you're the problem. They think religion's the problem. You got to overcome your upbringing and get past this, um, this, these fairy tales. The solution is not religion, but more education or to be in the right environment. This is often their solutions. So they deny sin. Now, in this next category of people are people who profess to be Christians. For example, there's a holiness movement that claims that the moment you become a Christian, you are now morally perfect. You no longer sin. And that is anti-scripture. Um, and I think, I know I've shared this story many times. Um, I remember my wife and I, we were at the Crackle Barrel, and there was this guy with a group of other people from a specific church, and in the back, of, they had the name of the, the church in the front, and in the back it says, um, if you think Christians sin, then you're going to hell or something like that. And and I was like, let me call him over. Gretel says, leave him alone, Albert, leave him alone. But I, I was troubled by this. So I said, sir, can I, can I ask you, what does that shirt mean? And his response was, well, we don't, uh, I'm a born again Christian and we don't sin. I go, so you're telling me that you don't sin? He goes, no, I haven't sinned in 17 years. And in, in the back of my head, I'm thinking, what do you think? When do you think was the last time he ever repented? Probably at least 17 years ago, right? So here he is walking with his sins unconfessed. Um, and technically, this holiness movement, they tend to be very judgmental on externals. They'll come, they'll look at the way you're dressed. They'll look at the woman's hair or earrings or whatever the case is, and they love to compare others with the externals. I've seen a lot of damage done by this. Now, I want to be careful I don't get off the topic. There are times when attire becomes an issue or even a stumbling block. And by that, I simply mean if a woman, for instance, has a low-cut dress, where you see, can I say cleavage or whatever, that could be a temptation to a fellow brother uh, in Christ. and Or they wear um, a skirt that's short, and then when they sit down, it goes even up. That's a temptation. So Paul addresses that in 1 Timothy 2. So I'm not talking about that. I am talking about, I remember my mother when she got divorced from my father, she did something that shocked this holiness movement. She got highlights in her hair. And that was a sin. And I remember this lady yelling at my mom, saying, your hair is no longer virgin pure. And getting into this whole thing, I was just like, virgin pure. My mom just stood there quietly, and we just left that church. And the thing is, you're not allowed to dye your hair. You have to wear dresses. And, and by the way, if you choose to wear a dress that goes down, my wife likes to dress conservatively, beautiful. And those are good things. But when you start focusing on people's externals, um, 
That's a whole other thing. I, I think I'm getting off the topic here. But that's part of the holiness movement. They claim to be morally perfect, that they don't sin, and therefore they judge others. There's a third group, and this is called antinomianism. How do you like that word? And that simply means these are Christians that say, I am forgiven, or my sins are forgiven, so therefore I'm free to live life the way I want to live. So they'll live in sin and without any sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. So there's no change in their life, there's no growth, and there's no walking in the light. They're just purely in um, 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 James, uh, Sandrita, I was going to say Sandrita, Sandra, I got to, yeah, I want to be professional here. I've been called worse. <laughs> now, those people who say that they're saved, their sins are forgiven, so they can live however they want. To me, that doesn't show that they're saved. Well, be correct? Yeah. Because I know we're not saved by our works. Correct. So that's... That's that, the tricky part. Yeah. Yeah. So that that isn't what I'm saying, but you ju you do judge a tree by its fruit. Yeah. I agree. I agree. You know, uh, you're, Paul talks about in many places. There's a there's a passage in Second Corinthians five seventeen, where it says that the um, the old is gone. We are new creations in Christ. That the old is gone and the new has come. The idea there's a transformation. I'm now a new creation in Christ. So there's a change. Why else would the Holy Spirit come into our lives other than to make us more like Christ? So I agree with that. And there needs to be a conviction there. That's the role of the Holy Spirit, John 16, that when we do wrong, he convicts us like, ah. Oh. So before I may laugh at dirty jokes, think it's funny. But now that I have Christ and somebody says this, you know what? I'm going to excuse myself. I don't want to be in that presence. What's the difference? Well, now the Holy Spirit resides in me. And I don't want to entertain that. I want to honor God. And not to say we do this perfect, but that's the transformation that the Lord Jesus is leading us into through the Holy Spirit. So very good. So, so there are se several groups that claim verse, um, that claim what well, verses of verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves and the truth is not in us. So there are consequences if we fail to acknowledge that we are sinners. One of the things is, verse 8 says, that we deceive ourselves, meaning that we refuse to examine ourselves. We think we're fine when we are not. Also, he says that the truth is not in us. We don't want God's truth. We reject God's truth. We go by our own truth, but our own truth is what's going to get, condemn us. But look at verse 10. He says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So if we also say that we don't sin, we're morally perfect, we're calling God a liar. Because God says we're a sinner and we're saying, no, we're not. We're accusing God of lying. We are sinners. And ultimately here, we're rejecting God's word. There's no accountability. Ab ability. Um, when I am in sin, fellowship is broken. Is that, is that true or no? If my wife and I, if I did something to my wife and I hurt her, does that mean that we're no longer married? Yeah, we're still married. But the fellowship is now broken. She's been wounded. She's been hurt. So what, what am I taught to do? Say that again. Apologize, right? I'm called to make things right with her. If I'm wrong, the fellowship has been shattered. I'm called to restore it. But that's the same way with God. When I sin against God, he doesn't abandon me, but the fellowship has been broken. I'm no longer walking in light. I'm now walking in darkness. And if you're walking in darkness, 
The fellowship between you and God has been shattered. Does that bother you? It should. It should bother us. It should absolutely bother us. So if we're going to, so what is the solution here? So if we're going to walk in light and oppose sin, there are several things that he tells us to do here. Here's the first thing he tells us to do if we're going to um, walk in the light. Look at verse, uh, where are we at? Verse 9. Verse 9 is the solution. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here, the first thing we're called to do is to confess. The Greek word here is homologeo, and it literally means to agree with. So when we confess our sins to God, what we're doing is we're agreeing with God, Lord, you're right. I'm living in sin. That's confession. You're not saying, well, I'm not sure you call it sin. I don't. That's not confession. Confession is coming clean. It's acknowledging that what I'm doing is wrong according to God. I'm in complete agreement with God because he's right. And where I disagree with him, then I'm wrong. The whole point is to come to a complete agreement with God, to line myself up with God and his word. Whatever God says, I'm agreeing with him. I'm saying the same thing. Homologeo, that is what confession is. If God calls something sin, then it's sin. But what we sometimes do, beloved, is instead of acknowledging that what I said was wrong, offensive, or my actions were hurtful, we compare ourselves to others. Yeah, I screwed up. But look how this person did it. They were worse. And we look for work, people who, who've done worse things than us. Yeah, I'm bad, but Hitler was worse. Well, of course, and everybody will shine if you compare themselves to Hitler. Right? So, or we either compare ourselves with others or we make up excuses. When you're driving and the car engine comes on, it's telling you something. Maybe you need to change your oil. Maybe there's not enough fluids. Whatever the case is, there's a warning. Can I tell you a common warning that occurs to all of us um, when you have unconfessed sins in your life? Ready for this? And this is very um, hard for me as well. It's when you become bitter. When you're bitter, when you find yourself snapping for a long period of time, that's the warning sign that there's issues going on in your heart that are unconfessed and they're being suppressed, ignored. That's the red, that's the flashing light, the, the oil symbol, whatever in the car, the, 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 whatever it is. Um, it is built up bitterness, it's angry, anger. And we all go through this, every, all of us, you know, you get tense when you see somebody or, oh, here comes so-and-so or, or whatever it is. And there's built up and it hasn't been confessed. It hasn't been brought to God. So it stays there and it stacks up. And as days go by, weeks go by, months go by, we just become very angry and bitter. And it's not me. It's all of you. We blame everybody else. And we don't take responsibility when maybe this is unconfessed sin within our lives. So we're called to do a few things. One, go before the person and make things right. Maybe they're at fault or you're at fault. Or maybe, usually both parties are at fault, but we make peace. And after we make peace, we go confess our sins before God. One of the most crucial things, beloved, that unfortunately it's lacking in the church is a healthy prayer life. Most Christians just don't pray. We say we don't have time to pray, but that's nonsense. We have time to eat. We have time to watch TV. We have time to go to work. We have to, If it's important to you, you'll make the time. But the reason why we don't pray is either we think it doesn't work 
or is meaningless or whatever the case is. When a person has a consistent, healthy prayer life where they come before God and they bring their burdens and Lord, I'm having problems with so-and-so. Maybe it could be my spouse or children or my in-laws or, or a boss, a co-worker, a neighbor, a church person, maybe a pastor, you know, whatever. Um, they get on under our skins. We got to bring that before the Lord and say, Lord, um, I'm having this issue, but more importantly, I don't want to have animosity in my heart. So I'm confessing this before you. I want to regurgitate this. I need to throw this up. And throwing up is always a painful feeling. But then after a while, you feel better. So we are called to confess. All right, so let me wrap this up here. Um, so the Apostle John explains in this letter what actually happens when we when we um, confess our sins. Here, oh, thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Here, verse 9, he says, if we confess our sins, right, that's what we're called to do. We're called to confess our sins. Number one, God is faithful, right? That means God can be trusted. You can trust in God when you confess Go to God. You can trust in him. Number two, he is righteous. Some of your translations may say he is just. And this, this is important because it means when you go to God, he'll remove your sins. He'll cancel your debt. They're placed on Jesus. He sets us free. And then also there's a beautiful word here. And righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So here he cleanses us. It's important to know that there's two types of cleansing. There's a vertical cleanse and there's a horizontal cleanse. And what this simply means is when I come before God and I receive Jesus, he cleanses me of all of my sins. This is the vertical. My sins against him, judgment will be no more. But then there's a daily type of cleansing that I need, what's called sanctification where if I don't take care of that is when I become more sinful, I become more bitter, more angry, etc., more rebellion towards God and my heart will harden. So the goal here is to walk in light and not to walk in darkness. And that's what John wants to challenge us. He's telling us Christians, we are saved. Let's be saved. Let's walk in the light for God is light. Because Jesus is light. Therefore, let's follow the light. And as much as possible, let's walk away from darkness. All right. Is there any questions? Any questions? What Was, was the message somewhat clear? Was there any confusion by anything that was, was said here? Hold on for one second, Joe. Sorry about that, brother. Talk to me, Joe. I said the light exposed our sins. The light uh, exposed. Life, we don't know where we're sinning without the light. That's we're right. living in sin every day. We don't know it. Yeah. Until we get that light on and Amen. open your eyes up. And then you see it. You're a sinner. Yeah. And you got to confess your sins and come to Christ. Yeah. Amen, brother. And you can do something about it. Uh, can I mention something gross? This is pretty bad. I went to um, uh, Macy's uh, a few years ago. And they had this, um, on the counter, they had this magnifying glass, you know, in the women's section. I was there with my sister when she lived here. And I looked in the magnifying glass, and the glass had a light. Uh, it was a, a round mirror with light around it, magnifying. I looked at it. I was like, wow, look at all those black heads. It exposed my face. Things that I, things that I never saw in the mirror, I saw it there. And the lady's like, you see that? So for $404,000, she could buy this cream. And I like, know I'll, I'll find other means. But that's what the light does. The light exposes. It exposes things that we don't see. Yeah, George? Pastor, just in closing, I have a brief commentary here in my Bible. Please. If we know the word, we will know that perfection is not in this at present. And will not be until the Trump sound. Woo. Yeah. 
So, uh, George, uh, can I, I just want to get, before I get Rosie, Rosie, I'll let you have the last word. George, what's your understanding of that commentary? What, what, what do you understand the commentary is saying? I agree with it. This, this is a Jimmy Swaggart's Bible. Okay. And that was part of his commentary on that verse 10. Right. So you know, what he's saying in essence is that we're still sinners and we won't be perfected until the Lord comes. The if trumpet. we know the word. Amen. Say. Amen. And many times we don't know the word in certain situations that we could defend our stance as Christians. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Right. Rosie. I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we have our sins and they're deep and dark. No one knows them but us. But there's a freedom in going to God with those sins that when you let it out, the freedom you feel, the goodness you feel when you're truly his and know you're forgiven. You don't have to tell anyone. It's only him you have sinned against. So therefore, what we have inside of us that we're hiding even from ourselves, we need to go to God with it and let it out. Amen. Unless, of course, if I've offended you, then I need to go to you and, of course, to God. Yeah, Rosie, Rosie was saying, yeah, when the Holy Spirit convicts you, he'll lead you to make, make peace with, with the other person. Amen. Diana. Um, Rosie, I want to add on to that, too, because when you have that secret sin, the devil holds that as a stronghold. Mm. And I think what yeah. God is speaking to me through you, um, the light, you need to bring it to the light. And then he will make it right because you confessed your sin in public and not have those secret sins because we all have secret sins and no matter whether it's small or large, it's still sin in front of God's eyes. And um, I think once we open up that secret sin, then like you were saying, it's freeing and we can continue on to God's work that we were put on this earth for. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah. Diana really could also, would you agree Sometimes bringing it to the light can be painful, but that's where growth happens. The opposite is to stay in the darkness where there is no growth, mm -hmm. where it's just hiding and you just stay there hoping not to be exposed. But bringing it to the light before mm -hmm. God, who is just, and I guess he says he's faithful and mm -hmm. just uh, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness there in verse nine. And and like I said, you know, the devil wants to keep us down. Yeah. He know he can't get our souls but he can stop us from proclaiming the word yeah. and to bringing other people to him, to the Lord. And, um, you know, it just, this is not our home. Yeah. And I just, I, it just makes me aware that um, no matter what age we are, we still have work to do for mm. the Lord. Amen. Amen. I want to conclude by saying, beloved, we're all sinners saved by the grace of God. And the fact that we're here, we're growing and God is faithful. We're better today than we were yesterday. And that's purely because of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let me go ahead and close out in prayer and then we'll and we'll dismiss. Gracious Lord, I thank you for today's lesson. Uh, John seems to be uh, very um, strong on focusing on your attribute of light, of holiness, and teaching us how to walk in the path you laid before us, Lord, that narrow path that leads to you life versus the broad way that leads to destruction father help us to understand that the ways of the world can often be poisonous and destructive and we know that even when we follow jesus and we may be mocked we know that his ways are always right even if it appears difficult at first thank you for allowing us to hear to gather so we can hear john's words that he uh that he based upon the words of christ that we can learn it, meditate it, and practice it, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk in the light, Lord, because we know that you are light. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. We thank you for those who are here, Lord, and, and I thank you so much for those who are also on Zoom. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.